We're talking all things closers with closer expert Greg Jewett on this Friday edition of the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast brought to you by Fantrax. I'm Rotowire Senior Editor Clay Link here with Closer expert Greg Jewett. Greg, I really can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your Friday uh, to join me and can't wait to, to chat with you, man. How you been? Good. Uh, pleasure's all mine, Clay. You know, you're a stand-up guy, one of the nicest guys in the industry. It's always oh. fun to uh, be able to talk a little baseball with you and and the fine work that everyone does over there at Rotowire. So, hey, good times. Well, yeah, Friday, really... Friday, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad that you were able to join me, and yeah, I, I owe you one for stepping in on a Friday. I certainly do, and uh, yeah, I wanted to congratulate you at, from the top on your championship win last year in the Tout Wars Head-to-Head League. Uh, you were kind of knocking on the door for a few years right there in the championship mix, and you finally got over the hump last year. How did it feel uh, as a champion this offseason? Um, it, it felt pretty good. It, it was, uh, you know... <laughs> It was, it was at that point, it was almost like a relief because I won, I was like the regular season champion. And then you're like, you know, it stinks. If I go through this head to head, had a really good regular season, I think I only had four losses in the regular season. And then you get into the playoffs where anything can happen. And it's like, yeah. your, your team has one bad week and there's nothing you can do. And it's like, no one cares what happened. Uh, Jewel was the one C, but the, you only see who wins the league. So, True. you know, I mean, it's it, and it's why, and that happened to you. I mean, you had a really good team a couple of years ago, and my team just had a hot week, and they took you out. I mean, it's that's the that's, that's the, the nature. yeah that's head the volatility head. of head to head. So it's <laughs> you have to be the best team that week. But um, as part of that, though, we did um, Ariel and I got a rule change in. So um, from being the league champ, I, I didn't really want to change any of the formatting for, so, for se, but, but this year we will be playing not only your head to head matchup, but you're playing the mean. So um, the, the average score or whatever. So if you, I might lose my head to head matchup with you and we're the two best scoring teams for the week, at least you'll still get a win for being above the median. So that's going to oh, balance things nice. out a little. Yeah. That should give us a truer playoff representation. I think, it's just a nice way to uh, put a little tweak to it. So it'll be interesting. So um, like I said, th- I know there was one or two weeks I was in a shootout. I was fortunate to win both of them, but the person who loses, that stinks when you're in a top three score and you lose a matchup. Yeah, I like that it, that change. That'll be good because there seems to be always in the league one person who just, mm-hmm. you know, due to the schedule, just kind of has a string of bad luck. But uh, yeah, that'll help balance out. The, the luck aspect that'll be great you beat out a pretty star-studded field included you know paul spore uh, frank stample from from cbs um nick pollock a lot of people so you yeah you should be proud it's a fun league it's kind of the i call it kind of the sleeper league of tout wars because you know a lot of people play head to head and um you know, we're a lot of times, especially here at rotowire we're so, so focused on the roto aspect but head to head is hugely popular and it is a fun game, even if it can be a little frustrating. Uh, but you, uh, yeah, not only the number one seed, but you went coast to coast. You, you made the most of it and, and won the championship. Do you remember who got it done for you? Did you have any big hits that, that really put you over the top last season? Um, I Actually, the, the funny thing was, is from covering relievers, uh, two of the – two of the pitchers down the stretch that really benefited me was I picked up one week, Nick Pavetta for like four bucks. Um, and then I picked up Michael King right before he was getting onto that trajectory to start logging more innings. Um, you know, they were both in my lineup, the the two week championship against Frank, who was the two time defending champ. He was going for the three Pete. Although the, the year before, if I didn't take your boy Alexis Diaz out of my lineup, I, I might've beat him the year before too, but we won't talk about that. Um, the, I still swear about Luis Torrens getting a save over Paul Seawald during that week of my matchup. That was, <laughs> that was just brutal, brutal. Funny I, the things you I remember. still, I still remember Scott, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and just, I was fortunate enough. I was aggressive, really. I wasn't confident in my pitching. Um, so I picked up 
uh, Tanner Bybee when he was called up. I picked up Gavin Williams. No, yes, I did get Gavin Williams. So, I mean, um, I, I, I just kind of just burned and churned. And then there was a couple of times um, with there's unique rules with towel wars uh, that, you know, but our, our listeners may not that if a guy's on an extended IL or out for the season, you can turn him in and get fab money back, which was beneficial. I lost a couple of people, but at the same token, that fab money helped me. Um, Cause like, I remember the last week when Frank and I were matching up, all I had to do was bid more than $4 and I can get whoever I wanted. And those are the little things that don't seem like a big deal, but when you have that little extra fab cushion, um, it just dictated. So I knew I could bid five on whoever I wanted and get them for that week. And, and it just, you know, it helps. Um, I even got a cheap save out of James MacArthur with that being, being the case on the last week there. So, you know, uh, just, it's big. and I got lucky a few of my dollar players hit, like I got Justin Turner for a buck and being able to move him all around when he kept gaining all kinds of eligibility last season. Um, and, and just little things like that. I, I had a couple of times where I didn't bid an extra dollar on Tristan Cassis. I kicked myself about, but you know, and I, you know, you can't beat yourself up too much when you end up winning the, winning the contest. Yeah. That's, I'm glad you mentioned that about the fab redemption. Cause you know, it seems like one one stuff, but knowing your rules mm -hmm. and the intricacies of your league, those little things, they may not seem important at the time, but you know, getting a few fab dollars back that really can put you over the top in those final weeks. Mm -hmm. I remember going up against Ian Codd in a championship and he had just had a few fab dollars left over for that two week stretch. And, you know, that was kind of the difference. He picked up Austin Hayes who had a monster couple weeks. So, you know, mm -hmm. you really want to know the intricacies of your league because you can take advantage of those and, and it could put you over the top if you're smart about smart about it. Now, I kind of, in the past years leading up to last season, I kind of did a Stars and Scrubs approach because it is a 12-team mixed league. Mm -hmm. Last year, I changed it up and tried to spread it around, and I kind of fell flat on my face. So <laughs> I think, you know, if you invest in the right players, you know, you can spread it around. But do you think in a 12-team mixed league like this that you know, Stars and Scrubs may actually be the preferred way to go? Yeah, uh you know, I, every year I say, I'm going to go in there and not overpay. And then all of a sudden I look up and I'm like most money spent and I'm like, crap. So I better start figuring out. I got a little low here. I better start figuring out who I can get for a dollar or two. There was like so many times I wanted to get somebody for like $8. And then uh, a couple of people would just go the extra buck or two knowing that I couldn't match it. And it was like a kick in the, kick in the stomach. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I think in a 12 stars and scrubs can be an effective thing, especially with the in-season fab. Um, you can make adjustments, address whatever might be a weakness on your team and, and do those sorts of things. So, you know, I don't say I go and doing it. And, and of course we see Ariel's there every year, Cohen with, he just sits there and waits. He doesn't bid, bid, bid. And he just kind of mm -hmm. hangs out. And then all of a sudden, when, when he sees that the, you know, there's bargains all over, he just starts swooping in and plucking guys. And you're like, oh man, he's getting X, Y, and Z for 15, 16, 17 when I was bidding other people up. So mm -hmm. I, th I think in an auction, you got to kind of be pliable unless there's like three people, you know, you're getting, and then you build everything around that. Um, but yeah, I I'm much more prone to do a stars and scrubs and 12 than a 15. No question. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think that was really well put because I kind of tried to model myself after Aria last year. And yeah, it's hard to be somebody in his own game. <laughs> yeah, I was out of my comfort zone and he, uh, yeah, it didn't work out for me. I guess if you invest in the right players, it can work. But I, in the past years, I kind of found myself really happy with the $1 players I got. And last year, mm -hmm. when I shopped in that mid tier more, I felt like I was overpaying for a lot of those mid-tier guys. So I think I want to get like one $40 player, maybe two $40 players, like five $20 players, and then just make do. Because I think having that foundation, there's so many in a 12 team, so much turnover, mm -hmm. so many guys you can pick up and add to your team that I think I think I may go back to the uh, stars and scrubs approach. Now with closers in this league, you have to have two designated relief pitchers. It doesn't have to necessarily be a closer but two guys who have relief pitcher eligibility. Mm -hmm. A lot of people stream starters who have RP eligibility there to, to maximize innings. But on the other hand, did you uh, find yourself paying for closers last year? Or is that something you usually do in this league? 
I, I don't, it's these, this, that's a good question because it's always nuanced. You, you, every room is going to be different, even if it's the same people every year, because everyone mm -hmm. has a different strategy um, from a year to year basis with saves. So um, luckily for me in that category, I can kind of adjust to the room. Um, I didn't walk in there thinking I had to have Felix Bautista. However, um, I was bidding on Helsley and I got out there and it got to a point I was just like, ah, that's too much. I'm not paying. I think it got to like 16 or 17 for Helsley. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm not going to go another dollar either. The person that was bidding against me was trying to bid me up thinking that that was my guy or however you want to put it, or that was their person. So I was just like, you can have them. And then I think a, a call or two after that's when Bautista came out and I was like, all right, this, I'm going to get him just in the back of my mind. It was, I know he can be volatile, but I knew about the stuff and I, I believed in the strikeouts because last year there was kind of a void with Edwin Diaz, not there. I mean, the year before he was the only one with more than hundred strikeouts as a reliever. Um, and you know, I'm not going to say I knew Bautista was going to have that level of a breakout, but from from everything, it just seemed like the things were going right with the Orioles. It was just like to me the right play, and, and it worked out because, as I was saying, you know, I, we for our subscribers at Recon, I track the points leagues totals every. I update those every day on this on the uh, closer chart spreadsheet, and, and he was just heads and shoulders above everybody because of the strikeouts. He just got so many that it was so, even when he. I think he still ended the year as the number one reliever in points, even though he missed the better part of or I think he missed more than two weeks at the end of the year. And he still came in first because of the saves he had and all those strikeouts he accrued. So, you know, I, I'd like to have at least one closer that I can rely on. And I did, I, I, in retrospect, that was probably my worst bid was I got Christian Javier because he had reliever eligibility. Um, I would have been much better off because I had Zach Eflin on every team, but that one, um, cause he had reliever eligibility too. I would have been much better served spending that money on Eflin in retrospect than Javier, but you know, it is what it is. And then that kind of a couple people were new to the draft last year. And once they realized that we could get guys that had reliever eligible or reliever eligibility that were starting pitchers, then all of a sudden the room started scrambling, trying to figure out, all right, so who else can I get in this bucket? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, you know, Pavetta and King, even though I didn't necessarily use them as relievers in those matchups against Frank, those guys were huge down the stretch because they were racking up innings when other guys were kind of tapering down. You know, even in championship, we Frank and I were meshing back and forth. Um, so it it helped me in tout, but it hurt me in my main event. We both, you know, I had Corbin Burns in my main event team, and he had him in our matchup. And then on his last start, he only went four innings. Cause he was, you know, the team was like just letting him get some pitches. So he, he missed out on the win and all that other stuff. So it's like those last weeks, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and that stunk. So luckily, you know, the Yankees and the Red Sox were letting Pavetta and King get, get all the pitches they could get. Cause it was the end of the year and they didn't care. Yeah. I think my approach to closers is going to change a little bit in this head to head league for Tower Wars, because in the past I kind of found that at least, it seemed to me at the time that people were overpaying for closers mm -hmm. because in my head, you know, points are points. You don't need saves to compete in the category. So why not go cheap at that spot? But actually from experience playing in this league now, several years, closers are actually really valuable because, you mm -hmm. know, you, there's only so many starts you could take advantage of in the half weeks. Some guys are just not going to be taking the mound in a half week. There are yep. bi-weekly lineup changes every, you know, every Friday you can change your lineup. And just having some of those closers in there to get the loose save every now and then is actually huge. And there's just, you know, even if you stack up with starters, a lot of two start weeks, there's going to be a lot of guys in the half weeks who are just, you know, zeros who aren't giving you anything. So I think it's good to have at least a couple of closers in a head to head points league to uh, swap in there. It does. Just, Oh, I'm saying I don't want to cut you off, but no, you know, some of our listeners don't know. Tout's very unique in our head-to-head -head that we can you it's not like the NFBC where you can only do up downs on hitters on Fridays. We can also move pitchers in and out yes. on Fridays. Yes. And and that's it's like, you know, I, I honestly didn't understand that rule till last season. Um, because <laughs> in our championship yeah. matchup in 2022, Frank picked up um um, Wesneski from the Cubs and started him on like a Tuesday and then he took him out on Friday and I'm like, 
what the hell's going on? I mm-hmm. thought he had to be in the lineup all week. And then, you know, Peter had to talk me off the ledge. He's like, no, that's, that's a rule. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, so I, I you know, yeah. every year I learned something new about the league, but yeah. So, having, so many different nuances. Yeah. Having the ability to take, to move pitchers and hitters on Fridays is massive. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's exact. What you're saying is if you, say you bid on two closers in our auction and then you grab a guy you think might be a closer on your reserve or you add a guy in season. So now you can start, you can start streaming them in and out. Um, so that's why a guy like King and Pavetta had value because whether they were getting a vulture win or picking up a save when a save is worth seven points and a win is worth seven points, that's, that's tremendous value. If you've got, you got three pitchers that aren't pitching and you can get a reliever in there to pick up that vulture winner save. It's it, it can swing your matchup. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the, the up and down moves for pitchers. Cause that really changes everything in the league. It's that's mm-hmm. such a huge uh, point in the league. I just wanted to get, before we got into the meat of the show, I wanted to, to yeah, congratulate you and talk a little head to head. The draft is coming up Sunday, March 17th at the Iroquois hotel in New York. I remember sitting next to you last year at I think the Edison Hotel Edison. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was little Edison. did I know you were drafting the championship winning team right to my left. But um, I congratulate you, and hopefully uh, we can, you know, one of us will take the championship again this year. All right, before we get into our closer talk, let me pause briefly to bring you a word from our sponsor, Fantrax. Fantrax is the most customizable fantasy platform in the industry offering the greatest fantasy experience for your dynasty keeper redraft and best ball leagues coming from another service. Fantrax makes it easy. Fantrax can import any of your current leagues and customize if needed. Fantrax offers the most in-depth player pool in the industry, including minor league players. Do you need a customizable commissioner service for your fantasy league? Fantrax offers more customization than any other platform waivers, categories, scoring system, schedule, Fantrax offers custom solutions for all that and more, and it's all free. Sign up for free today and be entered to win an official MLB signed jersey from my boy Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Simply go to Fantrax.com slash Rotowire and sign up today. That's F-A-N-T-R-A-X dot com slash Rotowire. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. I'm hoping to get Vladdy back on my Top Wars team for like the fourth or fifth consecutive. I was gonna year. say, yeah, I, I've only been in the league for three years, but he's he's been on Team Link every one of them. <laughs> Hope it uh, works out a little better this year than it did last year. Well, I got several questions for you, but we do have a question in the chat. I'll, I'll run by you first here before we uh, get into to what I have here. Uh, PJ says in the chat uh, he knows Jose Alvarado is the poster boy uh, for this pod. He is the the guy on the image. But he thinks Jeff Hoffman has a real shot at being their closer. And soon, former Reds great Jeff Hoffman. I kind of dismissed this at first, but he did have a pretty nice year last year. Um, I guess I like Orion Kirkering, you know, as the spec. But uh, do you think Jeff Hoffman could actually be a closer? This is like a three-part question. And and I love the picture he had up there because – my, the name of my main event team was the Heisenbergians. Uh, big fan of that show and, and the Walter White thing. So um, what what I don't like about the Phillies is when, when the manager says we have a floating closer, which basically says to you that they're going to play games on a day-to-day basis by matchups, who's available, and what the lineup pockets look like in the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings. So there might be a day where Jeff Hoffman matches up with the toughest part of the right-handed lineup in the seventh inning. Um, if there's a couple of strong lefties, say they're playing the Dodgers and Otani and Freeman are coming up, he's going to use Alvarado in the eighth, and then whoever he needs to get him through the ninth, he'll use. So is it Kirk Ring? Is it Sir Anthony Dominguez? You know, it's, it's going to be very hard for me to say that there is a definitive closer on that team. The only time that there was a definitive closer last year was when Alvarado got hurt the first time and Kimbrell got hot. You know, Kimbrell had a rough start to the year. Alvarado was looking great. Everyone was adding Alvarado. He had that like 21 to zero K to BB to start the season. I was like, Oh my God, it's Jose Alvarado. And and then he goes down. Kimbrell turns things around. He gets on a heater. They, and Sir Anthony Dominguez was struggling last year. 
Hoffman had his breakout in the second half. There were so many layers to it. Like people were drafting Gregory Soto last year thinking he might get saves. So I don't, I don't, I don't think we can attach that label to one of these relievers unless Rob Thompson says it. And that's, that just makes me hesitant as much as I was on the Alvarado train last year. I just don't know if I want the headaches. A, he was on the injured list two times last year, um, you know, and repeating these things. So like Hoffman did have a great finish to the year. Will he repeat those things? We don't know. Um, Saranthi Dominguez velocity's back. Uh, Gregory Soto did well. Matt Strom can get you a save when you need it. So I keep rattling off names and we haven't even talked about Ryan Kirkering, who the fantasy community is kind of already anointing as the next man up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's a lot of mouths to feed in that bullpen. And I just don't know unless injuries make decisions for us that we can rely on one person as the, as the primary save option in that, in that bullpen. I don't mean to cop out, but that's just how I feel about that situation. No, I think that's, I think you're spot on because I, I get the urge to want to speculate there because Jose Alvarado, as great as that stuff is that he has, you're right that he's battled injuries and also he can just kind of lose his command at a drop of, you know, drop of a dime. So as good as the stuff is, he sometimes has no idea where it's going. So I get the urge to speculate. I don't know if I'm going to because as you said, you know, people are already annoying and Kirkering is the next man up and he's being drafted in most 15 team leagues. So I, I just yeah. don't know if I'm going to be willing to, you know, use a bench spot to stash a guy like that. Who's got what, like three innings at the big leagues under his belt. Yeah. I, I mean, he was great in the minors last yeah. year, but even in the playoffs when teams saw him a second and third time, they had much better at bats because they started spitting on the sweeper. I mean, you can get away with throwing a sweeper 80% of the time in the minors, but major league hitters are going to adjust uh, and, and adjust better. Hmm. Um, you know, and the team said they're trying to have him throw more sinkers this year. And even today I looked at Statcast before we came on and he had through 13 pitches today, I think seven sweepers, six sink, seven sweepers, six sinkers, but he only got one whiff. Hmm. So, you know, again, it's only spring training. Yeah. However, if, if he's not racking out high K totals or is, is the force of nature that we think he is, how soon is he going to be accumulating saves um, and answer PJ's question? I mean, look at all the names I just rattled off. Do you see him usurping all of those people by May? I, I, I just I have a hard time buying into it um, just from that perspective. Um, you know, the kid could be great, but it might be one of those people where we're like, Next year, when he's a post hype guy, all of a sudden that's when he has his breakout. If that makes any sense, and totally, totally. I, it, like I said, the Phillies are one of the teams in a bucket that I'm just kind of like, I'll let somebody else get the get the gray hair at least at this point of the season in mm -hmm. in their drafts or auctions. Yeah, I I like the stuff that's that slider he has. Uh, Kirkering is great, but it is a little bit of a, a leap to think he's going to jump up that ladder. And, and be the guy right away. That, that's a lot of quality proven arms to, to jump. So he's, I think he still has some work to do to earn trust and it may not be as quick of an ascent to the closer role as some people think. Yeah. And last year at this time, we all thought it was going to be Sir Anthony. <laughs> Good point. Good point. You know, and, and if he's actually healthy and throwing well, there's nothing stopping him from getting safe situations, which as much as I love what Hoffman did in the second half, they might, you know, Rob Thompson might view him and they use him in the playoffs in like the fifth thing a couple of times. They they see him as a guy that they can put into any situation to succeed. So him being held out for the ninth inning, just it just may not happen. Absolutely. Well, I'm wondering among the top tier, say among the top 10 closers or so, is there anybody that you're avoiding that you're totally hands off in drafts? Uh, for me, it's a lot of times it's, you know, I don't have a strong feeling, but there are one or two in the top 10 that uh, I'm, I'm not inclined to take. But what about you? Anybody in that top tier that you're off of this year? Um, the, the only person I'll probably have zero shares of this year is, is Josh Hader. And it's not because he's with Houston or I'm worried about Ryan Presley. It's more of he hasn't thrown more than 60 innings in a season since COVID. You know, um, mm. His K minus BB percentage is going down. His swing strike rate's going down. And again, Houston's a very good analytical team. They might be able to help him improve and get some of those things back. But every year he says he's going to add more secondary pitches. And last year he still threw a sinker more than 70% of his pitches. He just relies on it. Um, and now you're going into a ballpark that rewards pulling fly balls. 
Um, so if he's giving up pulled fly balls to right-handed batters at Minute Maid Park, then, then we all know that's a recipe for disaster. So yeah. um, he did he did do better getting ground balls last year. However, you know he does like to elevate, and and guys are going to turn on that. So all I got to do is get a fly ball down the line, and I can be rewarded. And, and it just between the the shrinking K minus BB and the lack of innings. I mean, I think people still think he's a hundred K reliever and those days are gone. And, you know, and if Houston wins a bunch of game by five runs or more, then save chances evaporate. So there's, there's, to me, there's just too many things that can go wrong versus I know things are going to go right um, for me to pay the, I mean, he's going among the top three, closers taken in most drafts and mm -hmm. i just i'm not paying that draft capital for somebody that might get me 80 strikeouts and might get me 35 saves i you know i'm not going to say he can't get more than 30 saves because he's done it the last three years i think he's proven that's capable and not to mention you bring in the fact of all the stuff of the rules he had are those rules coming with him where he won't pitch three days in a row and things of that nature we don't know i mean the guy's talented I, there's i have nothing against josh Hader. He, I, I stood by him when people were dropping him back when he was going through his struggles after being traded from Milwaukee to San Diego. His yeah. son was having issues. I'm like, dude, there's stuff going on in the world that this guy can't handle. I mean, let him deal with his stuff and he'll come back and be fine. And he ended up doing that. Um, but I just, the draft capital versus what I think you can get as your return on investment makes him a, a no fly zone for me. A lot of really good points. I think, yeah, at his peak, having that, those 100 strikeouts from your closer was so valuable. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you're right that he's just not really that same guy. He was a guy that I actually would – had been willing to to take but you kind of you made some good points here kind of you can still take i mean yeah. you know he's still going to give you good ratios and those things yeah. i just you know if jo if Yohan duran got more strikeouts than him this year i would not be surprised at all um you know there, there's people behind him that i think can can match him from an sgp standpoint that i just don't i you know again the the price is high and, and i don't think it's going to go anywhere as the season approaches well, you make a lot of really good points. That's all I'll say. You know, I'm not going to say one way or the other if I'm going to draft Hater, but you make some points uh, to not not spending that capital on Josh Hater. For me, the guy that I'm avoiding in that top tier is Emmanuel Classe. Twelve blown saves last year. I know blown saves kind of you know noisy, but that's a pretty insane number. It seemed like he went through a stretch where he just couldn't could not nail down the game and you look at his k rate 21.2 percent i you know we've seen in past years this past years that there is more strikeout punch there but pretty uh dramatic dip last season over seven percentage points and 21.2 percent just not closer worthy they also tr traded for um what the name Barlow. is scott, yeah, Barlow. scott Barlow. that's you know i think barlow we've seen him close and have a lot of success there's also been Word of maybe the Guardians looking to trade Class A. Usually there's smoke to, to the fire. Did have 44 saves, but you know, he's the guy that I'm looking at that I just don't want to pay top dollar for because there's just too many, too many reasons not to draft Emmanuel Class A. I, I get it. Um, my counterpoint would be look at the bat bip. It was way off the charts. He had, a, he had a lot of blown saves. And of course I watch all of these things cause I'm that guy. Mm -hmm. um, they had a lot of like goofy, like little flares and squibbers that got through the infield. You know, if you cut those blown saves in half, he has 50 saves. And all of a sudden we're like, Oh my God, Emmanuel Claus is the number one closer in fantasy. I got to get a guy that can get 50 saves. So I get it. There's no strikeout ceiling with Class A. I mean, you take that, you just remove that from the from the process. However, if if you're just looking for a guy to give you 40 saves and you've got a couple of really good starting pitchers that are gonna that are gonna rack up strikeouts for you, and, and a lot of this stuff is build dependent. I, I I don't mind. I mean, he's entering his age 26 season. His velocity it was like low in spring and it never really recovered. He was like just sitting a tick or two below where he was the season before. And he tinkered with his slider, which, you know, so I know everybody wants these new grips and they want to get the new thing to make more strikeouts. Um, 
early reports are saying that the slider looks much better this year. He had a really good first outing in spring. I just think he's somebody that, you know, if push came to shove, I would rather have clause a over hater, but that's just me. You, you can, we all, there's a reason and we should never all agree on things and I, that's it. So I'm just giving the other side of it and, and people can do what they want in those drafts. But like I said, if you get him and all of a sudden you've got, George Kirby, you're going to be scrambling to get strikeouts. So just make sure you're you're paying att attention to how you're assembling all those moving pieces. Really good advice. Yeah, and I'm glad you provided the you know the other side of the argument because yeah, who knows? He could be the top closer in baseball, but it's just for me, there's just too much there mm -hmm. to really feel confident. And, and he out. could get traded. There, yep. There's no question. And. If the Dodgers decide that they're just going all in at the trade deadline and that they want to get Clause A to just so they can use Evan Phillips wherever they want, I could see that happening. Um, and if that does happen, and you're in a you're in a dynasty league or a keeper league, um, and and Barlow is a free agent at the end of the season, so that if 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 the Guardians decide that they're going to retool for next year, you could see them move both those guys. Uh, there's a guy down in Double A named Franco Ailman. He's like six seven nasty, nasty. Um, I, I think that's part of the reason they were listening to, um, they were listening on Clause A just because they know they've got this guy coming down the pike. Yeah, good name. That's a, I've not one that I'm familiar with. Uh, good, good to throw that out there. Well, I thought we'd move on to the, the mid tier and just kind of do a little exercise where as we look at these mid tier closing options, say our comfort level with, with drafting them, is it low, medium, high, just kind of off the cuff, but I thought we'd go through and talk about these mid-range closers because you know, a lot of these guys will bust. And, you know, it's it's when you're in a draft, it's hard to pull the trigger. At least I find it's hard to pull the trigger on a lot of these guys. But we'll start with Adbert Alzale on the Cubs. I, you know, I'm going to say medium because, you know, it's not like I'm avoiding him. I actually like the skills. Mm -hmm. Not really a target, I wouldn't say, but... I uh, wouldn't say I have low comfort level in drafting him. I think he will be the guy. Um, any concerns on your end in drafting Adbert Alzale? Yeah, I'll, I'll go medium as well, um, simply because he was shut down in September when they needed him the most with forearm tightness, which is mm -hmm. never music to anyone's ears for their closer. Um, so, you know, he's had a lot of health issues in the past. We just don't know if that was just a little – Maybe it was overuse or he was just fatigued and they needed to shut him down for that time period. Um, you know, I, I love the stuff. I love the celebration with the fist pump. I mean, it's cool. He's got a, he's got a, seems like he's a great personality. I, mm -hmm. I, I root for him um, and I'm kicking myself because I did hype him last preseason and I got no shares of him. And, and I was like, you know, we do all this and I, I hear all this other noise and I, you know, but why don't I listen to me? But, <laughs> but, but anyway, you got to so, trust your intuition a little correct. bit. Correct. Yeah. You got to do the Vlad Sedler there. You got to trust the gut. But, yeah, um, exactly. so I, I'm also medium. And, and the other reason I'm medium is because I, you know, Craig council went against them last year. So why wouldn't he come in from day one and say, yeah, he's my guy. Yeah. And he was like, well, you know, we're going to see how everyone looks in camp and whatever. So we don't know if that's because of the health thing or, 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 or what's going on or, or if council is going to do like the matchup thing, you know, and, you know, getting Naris help them because they can use him in those hold situations. But, you know, we'll see, uh, you know, play it by ear. I think I targeted him for like 23 saves when I did my own projections. So I, I think that's the over under number. Yeah, that seems about right because yeah, I think he gets the 20, 30 might be a little bit of a, a stretch, but who knows? Uh, Craig Kimbrell. Now he uh, dealt with a little bit of a hiccup this spring, but he, I believe he made his spring debut yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it should be all in the clear. I'm actually going to go high. I, I wanted to get him at TGFBI. Uh, missed out. You know, he's been around a long time. He's had some ups and downs in recent years, but you know, they brought him in with one purpose in mind. That's to step in and replace Felix Bautista. So mm -hmm. a great team, you know, great, backstop there in Rutschman to, to kind of help Kimbrell out, steal some strikes here and there. I'm actually going to go high because I, I like the, uh, you know, where he's going, Craig Kimbrell. Yeah, I agree. I, I, you know, he, he was one of two relievers last year with at least 20 or more saves and 90 or more strikeouts with Bautista. You know, it, we don't think of it that way, but he was very good in, in strikeouts. I mean, I don't know if you can repeat the ratios he had last year. However, 
it's a ball, it's a ballpark boost. I mean, those fly balls that sail out of Philadelphia are going to nestle in a glove in Baltimore. Um, you know, it might be one of those things where his home splits are way better than the road and, and whatever you'll tolerate that. But yeah, I, there's been a lot of people poo poo and Kimbrell and I get it. And apparently he's had these lower leg problems early in camp before he's got, it's got thick thighs like myself. So I get it. So, you know, it takes a little, uh, it takes a little time. as we get older, it takes a little longer to get all those things loose and flowing. So I, I, I feel you. So go get them. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I yeah. Yeah. 30, 30 saves could happen. You know, I don't know that it will just cause they, they should manage his workload a little better. He, he was fatigued. I mean, and in the playoffs, it was weird in 2022, he had these like crazy splits against the diamondbacks. They just had his number. I don't know if he tips his pitches against them, but he was on the Dodgers. If you look it up, he had like a ERA over seven against Arizona. If you took his numbers out from Arizona, when he was with the Dodgers, his ERA dropped by like over a run. It was crazy. Wow. But yeah, it's just that. goofy. It's but you know how sometimes a team has a guy's number. Yeah, exactly. I, I just feel like the Diamondbacks had his number. Um, so you know yeah, they might have, as you suggested, they might have been picking up something that he mm -hmm. was tipping. Right, he might just do something goofy, and they know it, and they're like, "Oh, there's the fastball, and I'm jumping on it." So you know, it is what it is. I just think where he's going, he's very solid. I mean, if he's your RP two, I think you're doing pretty well. So I'm right there with you. Now, next up, Andres Munoz for Seattle, and. Kind of a, a big piece with him is that Matt Brash has got this elbow injury now. It sounds like maybe it's not as serious for Brash as initially feared. Uh, diagnosed with right elbow inflammation earlier today, and he's expected to start playing catch early next week. But yeah, I think a lot of people saw Brash as a threat to Munoz. He mm -hmm. still could be, certainly, and they may spread the saves around. But I'm going to go with high on Munoz in my comfort level drafting him because – I mean, I, I get that there are some injury issues here, but I think he ends up with a greater share of the saves than a lot of people think. Yeah. Well, uh, once again, see, we, we, we disagreed on, on, uh, hater and class a, yeah. but I'm right. I'm right here with you. Well, that I, makes me feel good about I, being in I, lockstep with you. I took, I took Munoz above ADP and my TGFBI, but again, I'm picking that spot 14. So it's like, all right, I could I could have had him and a couple of other closers, but he's the one I took just because I want a little upside. I mean, it's TGFBIs, you know, you got to have a little fun with it. If there's an overall component, so why not shoot for the moon instead of taking the safe play? I mean, I could have taken Rizel Iglesias, and he's going to rack up a buttload of saves working with Atlanta. Uh, but I wanted the strikeouts, and you know that was a part of the allure, and you know. He missed time last year. He had the, the the foot injury before the season, which led to his, you know, when when the lower body is breaking down, it affects everything else. And I think the shoulder was a result of the foot injury. So he missed time last year. Um, I, I think the team wants him to get in there. And what people forget is he's on a very, very inexpensive contract by today's standards. I mean, they signed him when he was just – brought over they they bought out his arbitration years i mean he's dirt cheap from a closer perspective when you look at his money so why would they build up the arbitration money for brash when they can just put munoz in the ninth and, and let him be electric and his slider yesterday looked fantastic it looked more like 2022 than it did in 2023 which means i think he's healthy and they there's reports he's already hit 102 in camp jeez really that's great to hear i mean yeah i've always liked the stuff but he just says not to date kind of taken the reins as the full-time closer. Maybe it happens this year. You mentioned Rysel Iglesias. You know, I like him, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go only medium on him just because there's so many options, quality options in that bullpen. Mm -hmm. Add Ken Giles to that mix, by the way, he looks <laughs> like he could be a factor for them. What Would you say you're medium or, or maybe low on, on Iglesias, comfort. No, no, I'm I'm medium. I mean, like I said, their their team construct. I mean, Kenley Jansen had all kinds of saves with them when he was the closer, and then they shifted it the next year. I, it's if Atlanta just generates saves, uh, it's like one of the most safe things going in baseball right now. Is the the amount of save opportunities that they present to their closers is awesome, and it's you know you can't. So you're getting a Glacius and you're probably getting 35 or more saves. But the key here is how healthy is that shoulder? And that's what we all want to watch and monitor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we all worry about shoulder things. So like I said, Munoz is showing me he's got the velo right now. He's feeling good, looking good. Okay, I'm back. 
Um, I want to see that same sort of a thing from Iglesias. Now, again, he's 35, um, relies on the changeup now. Um, so again, we just, we just want to know that he's healthy. If he's healthy, he's going to get a bunch of saves, but there's a strikeout ceiling with him. And so, you know, he's not going to surpass X amount of numbers. So as long as the ratios are good, thank you. And we'll take the saves, but you know, we, we want to make sure he's healthy. Here's a guy who's kind of tough to, to nail down Tanner Scott of the uh, Miami Marlins. I just drafted him in TGFBI as my, my number one. I actually, there's somebody else that I wanted at that time, but they went right before. So I took Scott, I was looking under the hood and things, you know, pretty good. He's been a little all over the map Mm -hmm. performance wise, but last year things checked out really well. I'm going to go medium here because I did draft him, but any words of caution on uh, Tanner Scott? We want to know if the command, the command gains will stick. That's, that's what we want to know. And I've heard people say that it's against all odds that a reliever can just come out of nowhere, show improved command. And it's, it's, it's now in his skill set. And I get that, but it, his growth and strike percentage was very similar to what Ryan Helsley displayed in 2022. Um, and I didn't hear anybody downplaying Helsley because all of a sudden he was throwing strikes. Um, so to me, I think, I think it's, I think he's comfortable with Miami. I, I think Stoudemire Jr. works well with him. Um, my biggest concern with Scott will be is if the Marlins are not in contention, he's a free agent at the end of the season so they can trade him. So there's a chance if he gets traded to a contender that has an established closer, then he would slot back into the eighth inning. So if you're drafting him, just know that you might only get 20 saves if he gets traded at the trade deadline, as opposed to what you might be projecting for him and just have a backup plan. But it'll be enough in the season where in leagues with fab that you can adjust on the fly. It just, it just tempers his ceiling a little bit in draft and hold leagues, because like I said, he, he, I don't know how you feel about Miami, but I don't foresee them repeating last year. So I, I have a feeling he'll get traded. So then it's a matter of where does he go? Now, if he goes to Texas, then there's a chance he can end up going there and being the closer. So it just really, really depends on where he goes if he does, if he does get moved. But I, I, again, he was one of six relievers last year with more than 100 strikeouts. So well, you, you make know. a good case because yeah, you had to think that a trade, he, I mean, he makes a lot of sense as a trade candidate, Tanner mm -hmm. Scott. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, now Evan Phillips is a guy that we have heard straight from Dave Roberts mouth. He will get the, the brunt of the saves. <laughs> Do you think Evan Phillips has the potential to leap up into, you know, maybe that next uh, tier, maybe even into the elite tier of closers? I mean, he's been pretty elite the last two years. I mean, yeah. it's it's hard to imagine it. It's usually the Rays don't get things like this wrong. But he was a waiver claim from the rain from the Rays when the Dodgers picked him up. Uh, I, I think I put this tidbit in a couple of different places. But Evan Phillips, I believe, is one of he's the only qualified reliever the last two years with a WHIP below one in each season. So I mean, and and he's just been fantastic. So. Not only does he give you saves and he's on a very good team, but he also is a ratio eraser, which enhances his appeal. Um, I have no issue with getting Evan Phillips with the exception that, like I said to you earlier, if th there's a lot of veterans in that Dodgers leverage ladder that, you know, they, they've got Blake Trinan, Joe Kelly, you know, Ryan Brazier. If their bullpen goes sideways in the setup capacity, then the Dodgers at the trade deadline may decide, like we talked about earlier, all right, we're going to go get a closer so then we can use Evan wherever we need him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so same thing. His 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 Achilles heel would be if the team decides that they are going to put him into the highest leverage reliever role and go get a veteran closer because they don't care who takes care of the ninth inning as long as he takes care of the toughest parts of the lineups of the teams they're facing. Really good stuff there. Thanks for uh, playing along with me there on just you know the mid tier uh, range of closers, and now we'll transition into our discussion on closers and waiting. And we've already had uh, some shout outs in the chat. Uncle Ted mentioned Prelander Baroa. It's kind of getting some hype, and man, it's a land of opportunity there in in Chicago. Um, 
who yeah. knows who's going to close there, but that's that's pushing it a little bit for me. Even in a 15, I could see him being drafted, but I, I probably won't be the guy to, to take Prelander Barroa. Great name, though. Uh, I, and he's got great stuff. Yeah. It's just a matter of um, he's a guy that needs the command jump. Um, and I, we just don't know what the White Sox are going to do. Uh, and, and how many saves are they going to generate? Uh, I, I think that's the... To me, that's the hardest part. It's like you look at the White Sox and the A's and a couple of these other teams, it's like, okay, I might get their guy, but how many saves am I going to squeeze out of them and, and, and how much is it going to help my team? So um, any of these people should be an RP3 or a stash, and, but it's going to be really hard to stash someone like Prelander Baroa in an NFPC format when you only got seven bench spots. Again, again, I love them. In a draft and hold, I'll, I'll – I'll take that shot if I'm just looking for a guy that might give me five to seven saves in the second half. Um, again, because that kid, that kid can be electric. And, and, you know, I, I had him in my first fortune 500 post on recon as relievers, the target past pick 500. We, 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 we use the premise of guys that can get you five or more saves past pick 500. Um, and he was in the first one that we published. And, you know, again, I believe in his stuff and that was when he was with Seattle. So, I mean, there's an easier path to saves in Chicago. Um, I just, I just, I just worry that he becomes the fantasy poster boy where people want him to be the closer versus he will be the closer. If that, you know, you know, we have to see how that all plays out. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's yeah interesting. I just, yeah, I think he's a guy that if you draft, you may end up cutting a week into the season. And then you're going to end up trying to bid on him when he does come up and, and get gets his right. first save. And then you're paying a hundred dollars in fab and you're like, Oh man, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's, it's tough. Um, you know, it's on all those things. So like the next man up stuff is always difficult because you're, it depends on the team, how the manager runs his bullpen. And then we can't predict injuries. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that guy that you think is the next man up isn't even, the next guy up. It's no, I, I remember turning to somebody else. I remember when Ryan Presley got hurt. Um, I think it was the year before last. And you, I looked at all the metrics. I looked at the, the leverage index and how, how the relievers were pitching. And I was like, everything says Hector Nera should be the closer. And Dusty Baker used Rafael Montero because yeah. he used Neris. Like I was just talking about Phillips. Neris went against the toughest parts of the lineups. And then Montero just came in the ninth and, and scooped up the saves. And he wanted to be able to use Naris whenever he needed him. And he was like, I'll just let Montero do the ninth. And, you know, I felt like I had egg on my face, but I can't predict what the manager's going to do. I can say who I think or deserves to be the next guy up, but I can't say that it's going to be that person. Like I, I see Fox Mulder has Brebia, Ursig up there. It's like, we don't know what Oakland's going to do. And and we don't know how many saves they're going to generate. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, Ursig had a nice year as a reliever last year. Um, but they need people to absorb innings. He might have, he might get stuck into a multiple inning role. We, we don't know. As a matter of fact, the team has said uh, the last post with the roster projection, and no one knows what we're going to do with Mason Miller, but uh, Martin Gallegos quoted that it was the, the high leverage mix will be Danny Jimenez, Trevor Gott, and, and Mason Miller. Now, how that happens, is Mason Miller going to take the Yohan Duran path to relieving are they going to try and build them up as the season goes, like the Yankees did with Michael King last year? You know, this this is also going to affect Garrett Crochet. He can end up getting saves in Chicago, even though they're saying they want to stretch him out. They might just decide that we don't have anybody else, so we need him to close some games. I mean, you look at you look at how he handles Shohei Otani, and you can imagine him in the ninth inning, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't be the only one seeing that. So, you know, I, I think a lot of these teams, I'm going to let the I'm going to let people draft them and then I'll adjust in season. If I want to add one of these people, if they show me that they're going to emerge in that role. Yeah. Really good stuff. I, you know, closers and waiting always a popular topic. I find myself nowadays less inclined to use a bench spot on some of these guys because, you know, if they don't get the job early on, you're just so tempted to cut them. And as you said, you know, you end up paying out the wazoo anyway, later on. Um, but I, you know, it's always fascinating to, to think about some some of these guys. And uh, James MacArthur was a guy that Todd mm-hmm. mentioned last week is kind of interesting. I've also I've got my eyes on Daniel Robertson in Texas. Not really like you know closer and waiting per se, but 
you know, Bruce Bochy was, you know, he's an old school manager who you know, turned to Will Smith early on last year. He just doesn't seem to be all about Jose Leclerc. He would not mm-hmm. name him the closer at the start of camp. So Robertson's a guy that I'm kind of interested in. Any closers in waiting, quote unquote, that you're eyeing up in drafts right now? <laughs> all right. So, I mean, give um, me all your secrets. Uh, well, I got I got to get people to subscribe to me too. I can't yeah. get it all, but I'll go give it all away, baby. No, um, here's uh, I, again, um, my my man PJ's popping up a couple of people that I've I've been. Hopefully, he subscribes to one of my sites because he's naming people that I talk about a lot. But anyways, uh, at some point, Boston's going to trade Jansen. Now we don't know when they're going to trade Chris Martin too. Um, there was a really cool article on the Boston Globe yesterday. It was kind of like the the premise of the thing was like. Kenley Jansen's here, but it feels weird. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like everyone's kind of around the room looking and waiting for him to get the text saying, all right, come see the GM. Cause you've been traded. Yeah, um, it's got one foot out the door. Yeah. Years. Yeah. It, it, it does. It's so weird. It's like, how do you build somebody's trade value when you're basically telling the world, we don't want mm-hmm. him or his salary. Um, you're killing so, your leverage. Yeah. So, you know, yes, Chris Martin could come in and scoop up the early batch of saves, but again, He's a free agent at the end of the season, so odds are he's not finishing the year in Boston either if if we're staying with this premise that they're going to be trading anyone that's a free agent at the end of the year because they're doing a rebuild on the fly or retool or whatever you want to name what Boston is doing. Um, so I'm okay getting Chris Martin as a closer and waiting. Like I'd much rather spend a 28th round pick on Chris Martin than, than some other people that we've talked about already. You know, I'm not going to... I'd rather have Chris Martin on my bench than Prelander Baroa just because there's a chance he could he could walk into save situations within two weeks of the season. Um, if mm-hmm. if a closer gets hurt on another team, then you're gonna see Jansen get moved to him. You know, it, it almost feels inevitable. I mean, the Phillies were talking about Kenley Jansen too, which again gives me pause for a lot of their relievers because they were one of the most interested in getting Kenley because they almost see him like Kimberly. So right, we can put him in the ninth and then Thompson can do all of his matchup stuff and all the other innings. And they've got two lefties, two righties, and almost sets up their bullpen in, in a really nice matchup way. So a um, fit would make some sense. It does. Um, I, I know people like Jason Foley, but I, I do think if Lang struggles with his command, if that continues, I, I think Shelby Miller, somebody to keep an eye on in that bullpen. Um, he really did well with the split finger last year, which is like the, hip in pitch to have this year, even though Nick Pollock hates it sometimes, but you know, it's, he, he hates it as your number two, not as, as being a part of your arsenal. So, and especially for a reliever, we don't need, uh, we, we can get away with using that as a strikeout pitch. Um, you know, I'm trying to think, I, I know a lot of people are in on Yuki Matsui. I, here's, I, I only worry about Matsui because a, he's the same height as me and, and Clay, you've met me in person. I'm not a tall guy. Um, Norma. And, you know, he's already had some back issues. Japan's not used to the travel, the the amount of games that you're required to play on a day-to-day basis. I, I just think it's going to take him a little time. I mean, yes, his first outing was fantastic, and he racked up three strikeouts, and he looked like the next coming. But we don't know if he's going to be durable enough to handle this season. He, I mean, after that outing, he was out with back spasms. So we don't know if he was overthrowing or if it's just a little glitch or he slept wrong in his hotel room. Those are the things that we're not informed about, but to just turn over the keys, all most of these players, especially relievers that come over from the MPB, it usually takes them a month or two. Like remember when we were all anointing Robert Suarez, the closer mm-hmm. for the Padres, and then he got obliterated on opening day. And, and then in the second half of the season, he figured things out but there's a transition period. And mm-hmm. I think we're overlooking that in, in our, in our want to push somebody into where we want them to be. We're ignoring the things that could make it difficult. Um, so, you know, those are, those are a couple of the names that I'm in on. If, if you give me a team, I can give you somebody mm-hmm. um, right off the top of my head. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I do kind of like Robert Suarez, just because you know Matsui is already dealing with that back issue, and and they paid them to be the closer. Yeah, and there've been some like, when they gave that him they, that contract, it was like you're yeah. our closer in waiting. So, you exactly. know, he's going to have to implode to have them just start turning it over to other people. Do you think Hunter Harvey finally takes the reins in the ninth inning for Washington? 
God, I want him to. And, yeah. and I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I thought Washington would trade him or Finnegan in the off season. It was, it was a ripe time to trade relievers because they were hot on the free agent thing. There was all kinds of lucrative contracts with the exception of a couple people when, when the Boris stuff started happening. But, um, God, Harvey took the role from him in July and then he went on the injury list over the all-star break and that opened the door again for Finnegan, you know, and I, I did a big long post as a main event primer at reliever recon and the people who picked up Finnegan, I mean, that was massive for, he didn't have like a huge max bid or anything like that. And he, he just piled on saves. He, yeah, he, he turned it on. Yeah. It was he was, incredible. he was a difference maker. I'm sure in a bunch of leagues and, mm -hmm. you know, he was one of the few last year that really hit um, at, as somebody off the waiver wire that provided you with that bounty of saves that, that could shift you from like seventh to third in your league, which is monstrous when, yeah. when you're in a, when you're in a contest like that. So, um, definitely. And, and I do like James MacArthur. It's kind of funny. He could end up being like this year's Alzali where the, the team throws a bunch of people and then none of them work. And then they finally come back to the guy that they probably should have been using from the get go. So, you know, there's, there's a chance that he takes over as the primary like save person, but it might not be until June, which is kind of what happened with Alzali last year. So we'll just have to monitor how that happens. I mean, you know, if you want to take Will Smith way late and just try and milk 10 saves out of him, you can do it. I just don't know if the fastball will hang on to enough to make him, to make him be able to stay there. Um, and, and I also could see the Royals using like, Smith against the lefties and Schreiber versus the righties. You know, you could almost see um, a matchup situation in those high leverage situations. And they use MacArthur as the guy that kind of match up with the toughest parts. So, I mean, MacArthur was unbelievable at the end of the season. Uh, if you saw his sequence against Jordan Alvarez, I was like, oh my God, this guy's pretty good. Now, can he repeat it is, is what we want to see. Well, Greg, this has been fantastic. You are the foremost expert in your field and I appreciate you letting us you know, pick your brain a little bit here. Of course, you contribute over at The Athletic. Where else can people find your work, Greg? Well, uh, I'm, I'm busier than a one-legged guy in a butt-kicking contest, so I'll, I'll keep it clean for the viewers. But uh, um, I, I run Reliever Recon, and I have a great staff with me. Um, we do all kinds. Now, um, Recon's pretty intense. Like, I do an article pretty much every day, like every day. I, I do a version of um, Jeff Zimmerman's terrific Mining the News pieces. I call it Closer Cliff Notes. Um, I go through notes, roster projections. When I see something or read something, I pop it in there um, and I recap the spring games. I include StatCast data when it's available. I, I just try and really be overprepared if that's, if that's something you can do with relievers. Um, and, and we're very NFBC heavy. Like we do Sunday Fab Five where we go through five relievers that we think are worth bidding on um, up before the, the Sunday lock. Um, with, with your bidding and things of that nature. And we also have a guy who takes care of um, head to head leagues for streaming like relievers for vulture wins or, or saves when guys are on like two days of usage and back to back. Somebody you can just pop in your lineup in a Yahoo league and get a cheap winner save that might swing your head to head matchup. So, um, oh, and I also have a guy who does points leagues articles on there. So we kind of cover as much as we can. Um, and then Two of the members of my staff um, are joining me to do some stuff. We we also um, we are taking over Closer Monkey, which is really cool. Um, so you, if you if you've been following Closer Monkey for years, I'm sure you've seen the Twitter's been a lot more active lately. Um, that's because of me. Um, and and I've I've tried to bring some of what we do at Recon into the daily updates. So um, we had we already posted tiered reliever rankings at Closer Monkey. If you want to come check us out. Um, and then there's the, the premium package at Closer Monkey is $20 for the season. You get the emails that don't have to, you don't have to click through the links on the site. Um, you know, cause Close Monkey does cater to a lot of people who don't want to pay money for content. So you just have to surf through the, the ad pop-ups, but, um, and then reliever recon is only $5 a month. So, I mean, if you go out on the weekend and get a cup of coffee at a Starbucks, you could get all the great information that we provide for the same price. So. Um, yeah, that's, and then the athletic next week, my, uh, closer rankings, I believe will be publishing on Monday or Tuesday. I'm going through the formatting like Eno did with his pictures. So it'll be like that nice cool box. We hit the drop down. There'll be a comment and some, some cool stats. 
Uh, and then later in the week, we'll have our, our souls piece with saves plus holds. So, um, yeah. Yeah, you uh, are a busy man indeed. <laughs> and then I got to try and figure out my prep for main events and tout wars. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I really can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your Friday. Given all you got going on, it, it really means a lot. And I uh, can't wait to see you in New York next month, Greg. Yeah, it'll be cool. So. Thank you for having Just me on. Make it easy on us. Yeah, thank you for oh, please. Thank you for having me on. I love everything you guys do. Rotowire is just a fantastic resource. Um, so you should be subscribing to them, me, and all the other people. No, I'm just getting on. So yeah. Anyways, yeah. No, definitely it's... follow Greg's work. It is top notch. And give him a follow on Twitter at gjuit9. And uh, yeah, can't wait to uh, to see you. And I owe you one for taking time out of your Friday. Greg. It's ne- never a problem. Anytime. Well, great stuff. Thank you all for being with us. Hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll be with you again soon here on the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast, brought to you by Fantrax.